It's our delight today to, to have a, as a visiting speaker, Stuart Altman. As you all know, this is part of a series of, of talks uh, about the future of healthcare, given as part of our strategic planning process. Uh, Dr. Altman is the Saul Chalkin Professor of National Health Policy at the Heller School of Social Policy and Management at Brandeis. He's an economist whose research interests include healthcare economics uh, and policy, healthcare industry reform, and Medicare. Among his many professional achievements, he served 12 years as chairman of the Congressionally Legislated Prospective Payment Assessment Commission, PROPAC, formed to advise Congress and the administration on the functioning of the Medicare uh, DRG hospital payment system. Uh, and other system reforms. He's also chair of the Health Industry Forum, which brings together diverse group leaders from across the healthcare field to develop solutions for critical problems facing the healthcare system. His talk today will be on slower growth in spending. Will providers um, uh, um, will it require providers to become more uh, efficient? States can help. Um, a couple of housekeeping details. Um, like in prior sessions, this is being broadcast to two other sites, one in New Brunswick and one in Piscataway. I guess we can't, in this room, we can't see those other sites. So, um, oh, 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 you can, see, oh, there they are. Okay. So in, it, uh, later, if you have questions, be sure to say them into the microphone so people can, can hear you in the other sites. On um, the same way, if there are questions uh, in the other sites, uh, in case we don't see you wanting to ask the questions, um, uh, please just call out. Uh, for those um, who are here um, in, in this room, um, we'll, we'll be, uh, after the talk is over, we'll, uh, we'll have a group of people, if they want to meet with Dr. Altman, Altman afterwards, to be able to sit and talk for a while and ask him questions. We'll, we'll have a, a, a session open for him. So, um, Dr. Altman, it's a pleasure. I guess I need to stand over here. Is that the idea? I usually don't like to stand behind podiums. I tend to disappear. Um, but um, I, I can stand on a, but, all right. Can you see my head? Can the camera see my head? Well, it really is a pleasure. Um, I was telling the chancellor, I, I go in, in some strange way, way back to Rutgers. I mean, I go, um, I grew up in the Bronx and, um, my father worked in Linden, New Jersey, and so you can imagine, you know, the trip he had. So when it came time to go to college, you know, all the kids were going to the city colleges in New York. This was back in the 1950s. But my father said the one private school that he would let me go to was Rutgers. At that point, it was a private school. So uh, I have now heard how it has changed. I've been here. Uh, I visited the institute um, a couple of years ago and uh, down in New Brunswick and saw the changes that are going on. And here I was hearing about the, all the exciting new efforts that are going on here. Uh, so it, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, now, I never did ask anybody how this thing worked. I was like, talking, which buttons? These buttons, great. Okay, good. So here's the deal. Uh, this is what I want to talk about. Um, uh, we are engaged in a, um, intri you know, we're all part of a very complicated healthcare system. And I think it's fair to say we all understand that it is the most expensive system the world has ever seen. Of course, the way you look at this elephant depends on where you sit. And I sh from the chances point of view, it's not, you know, it can use a little more money uh, as well as many of you, and I can completely understand it. Of course, for the people that are paying the bills, it's getting harder and harder. Now, I should, you can probably sense from the color of my hair and the fact that I went to college in the 50s that I've been around a little while. And um, so, I, I, you know, just to give some orders of magnitude, you know, we, we are dealing with a situation started in healthcare back in in the early 70s and had a interesting perspective I was trained as an economist and uh, wound up in a long story that I don't talk about sober there I became the chief regulator in this country for all the for all healthcare which is the only time the federal government ever tried to control healthcare costs back during the economic stabilization program. And for those of you who are a little younger, which is probably everybody in this room, I just want to give you some orders of magnitude. 
we were spending $75 billion on health care, and it amounted to 7.5% of GDP. So, and of course, I had no background, really, in health care. Health care economics is a, really didn't exist in any large amount uh, uh, as a force and a field uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the 60s, and it was just emerging. So, and I was a classically trained economist, so I had no background. In, so it sounded like a lot of money to me. Uh, and people, I got called into the, well, the story was that I, I, I came to work one day. I was a health policy person at what was then HEW, and I got a call to come to the White House. And I was scared out of my wits because basically there were rumors that people went to the White This was during the Nixon administration, Haldeman and Ehrlichman. People went to the White House and were never seen again. This was not something that a 32-year-old with three little kids really wanted to hear. So anyway, I went to the truth has side, went to the White House, and the president wasn't there. But sitting around the table were all the president's men. Sorry, there were no women. And, and the chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors said, do you know, Dr. Altman, that if we exceed 7.5%, if we reach 8%, the level of inflation will just destroy our whole country? And for those of you who've been asleep, uh, that 7.5% of GDP is now 18%. $75 billion is probably $2.9 trillion by the time we finish this lecture. So, you know, we are dealing with a very complicated and an expanding sector, which has been growing by two, two and a half percent more than our GDP over a very long period of time. However, in the good news side of the stories, over the last couple of years, this growth has actually slowed. So if you look at this chart, I hope everyone can see it in other places, the growth rate, these are the growth rates, by the way, has actually reached a lowest level we have seen since those early 1970s. Recently, though, there is some uh, evidence to say that the growth rate is now ticking up a bit. So the question that I raise with you and you have to think about and you're different is, is this a sustainable growth rate? Are we going to go back on the good old days if you're in the spending business and a bad old days if you're in the paying business? Um, or is this, these growth rates going to continue? at slower amounts. So there are some who believe that the current slowdown will be permanent. And their argument is that we will see small, we are already seeing small positive changes in the market, which will keep growth in place. Things that are good. Providers have become more efficient. Efficiency is much more the name of the game. We are seeing uh, around the country less hospital acquired infections which not only improve the quality of care, but also in reduce the costs. Um, Rehospitalization, which has been a really tough issue, and I'm sure uh, the chancellor and others uh, in working in hospitals and healthcare realize that a lot of that rehospitalization can be positively impacted on, but it requires a change in emphasis. And yes, hospitals are now being penalized uh, for failure to do something about it. And I spent a lot of time with hospitals. And for those of you who run hospitals or are involved in hospitals, the typical reaction of the hospitals was, why are you blaming me? Why are you blaming us? We did our job. We took care of that patient. We got the hip replaced. We got the heart fixed. We got whatever. And uh, we turned it over to the next part of the system. And the fact that they've come back, it wasn't us. And, and now we're being penalized. And the answer was, yeah, I know. And the question is, why did you pick on us? And I'll tell you quite frankly, the reason why hospitals got picked on is they're the biggest game in town. And there was enough evidence to know that it wasn't necessarily the hospital's fault, but it was the hospital's capacity to change it by really recognizing that they were not through with that patient when they finished that part of the care. And you know what? It's working. We are seeing a reduction in rehospitalization. And then finally, but not finally, um, the issue about patient cost sharing. 
um, is a very contentious area, but the reality is then when patients face some amount of cost sharing, higher deductibles, co-payments, they do become more concerned about certain aspects of whether they really need that x-ray or whether they can get it at a less expensive place. And probably the most contentious part of this change is the growing use of limited or tiered insurance networks. And that is playing out all over the country in different ways. And I'll talk about that in Massachusetts, and I'm sure we can talk about it here in New Jersey as well. One of the areas that um, some have talked about is that we've gone through a hiatus in terms of the introduction of expensive new technologies, but I think that is coming to an end. And we heard about it recently with the, the new drug that uh, can deal with hepatitis C, which is sending insurance companies into a tizzy. Uh, and uh, there are many other high-priced, particularly oncology drugs that are coming online. So we've had this kind of slowdown. But for those of you who are in the biomedical world, uh, um, I'm not sure that that is going to continue. But. Here's the but. There are two sides to this coin, and I need to emphasize this. One is the spending side, and the other is the revenue side. Last week down the road, um, I run for the last 21 years. Joel Canto can remember this well. With the help of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, we created what's called the Princeton Conference. And, uh, it's, and not only it's co-chaired in a way by a young economist uh, down the road a bit, Uwe Reinhardt. Some of you may have heard about him or have been taught by him. He and I have been good friends since the beginning of this crazy world together. And he and I were sitting having a talk uh, before, and he said something that, that is absolutely correct. He said, in, health, in the rest of the world, they talk about payment. In healthcare, they talk about reimbursement. And what he meant by that, and what I mean by that, is that healthcare, for the most part, has been fortunate in the sense that it has generated the costs, and then it expects the payment system to pay for them, to be reimbursed. And that's what the word means, to reimburse for costs. In most other industries, you know what your payments are, and then you have to adjust your costs to those payments. So here's the question for you and the question we look at. Going forward, can you expect and count on a payment system that will reimburse the healthcare system for the cost that you believe is appropriate? Now, I'm not, let's hold whether those costs are legitimate or not. Obviously, much of them are. You know, for someone like myself, who's no longer 31 years old, truth of the matter is I am falling apart, and I care a lot more about the quality and availability of care. So I'm not talking about myself. So to the extent that the costs are being generated to take care of me, um, I'm all for higher costs. To the extent that they're taking care of you, I care less about that. But the reality is that the question that you have to ask yourself is, will there be the money out there from the various spigots that pay for health care to supply these money? So as we look out into the future, we have a lot of skeptics. And one group of skeptics uh, for those of you, for you and me who really understand Washington, the real power in Washington is not with the Secretary of Health and Human Services or the President or s s the Chairman of this committee or that. It's for those, those people who economists instinctively don't like. They're called actuaries. And they are all powerful in terms of determining how Medicare pays, what rates is, stuff like that. And they're the ones that send the rate. And their, their view is that they think we're heading for $3 uh, trillion very quickly and that we will exceed 20% of GDP. So they are very skeptical. 
But I do believe that this slowdown will is real and will some with some bumps in the road we will not go back to the rates of growth that we have seen in the past not that we won't grow but that we won't go to 2 2.5% more than gdp but as i said the first quarter of 2014 we have seen a very large increase actually the largest increase since 1980 so we may be back on that trend but let's see how this is going to play out so here's here's my take on this issue even without health care reform and all the money that is now and will be flowing into the health system through the ACA we are seeing a very dramatic shift in where the dollars come from I did this slide several years ago and I'm not prepared to it took a lot of work and so I'm, I, it, the story is still the same. The numbers may be different and he actually strong. I'm waiting to figure out how many states are going to go on Medicaid expansion and so on, because I don't want to do it and then do it again. But the story is the same, and the story is very clear, that over time, if we take our hospitals, there is going to be a significant shift in the payer mix. Now, you take a place like Rutgers, you're already there. Who, who here understands the finances of your hospitals? Who's, your, who's the finance people here? So what percentage of your uh, revenue, or more importantly, what percentage of your expenses are government patients? I bet you it's 70 to 80 percent. So you are the future of our health care system, whether you like it or not. Now, the average in 2020, in t a couple of years ago, was, six, was about 55 percent. But you go into an institution that has large Medicaid population, as you do, you, you know what I'm talking about. Your ability to shift costs to private sector is quite limited. You have, you are, so I'm talking to the converted. You have to live within the revenue more than a lot of hospitals. They just turn around and they find out what they get from government, uh, Medicare and Medicaid, and then they, then they look at their shortfall and they go to their private insurance ATM machines and they say, well, you were at Penn before, you know. I mean, there was, I, we can talk about that later. <laughs> they go to their private ATM machines and uh, and say, you uh, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so the going forward, this number is only going to go up. And, you know, I, I, it can't go up much more for you, but it will <laughs> a little more. But the rest of the country is going to catch up. And um, so, and therefore, the ability to sort of generate those funds are quite limited. I played around. Um, this is a, a this chart is what I call payment to cost ratios, which is how much each of the major sector pays relative to the cost of the care of that sector. And the green is is private insurance. And the red is Medicare, and the yellow is Medicaid. And you'll notice that the yellow and the red, except for a little brief period, is below 100%. And the green is significantly above. Now, there's a big debate that's been going on forever, and Joel, I'm sure, would agree, you know, that some people say that, the, that we call it cost shifting, that hospitals and, and other institutions have the ability to generate more money from the insurance companies when they need it. As I said, it's their ATM machine. Some economists believe that's not true because they're always trying to maximize the amount of money and, and uh, therefore the, it's, it, it's not true. I think there's a little more than a little truth, but truth is probably in the middle. It depends on where you live. And we've now recently had a number of studies uh, particularly done by Jamie Robinson at the University of California and others. And it, it depends on where you live and the ability of the healthcare system to turn to the insurance industry and say, we're short of money, uh, we want another 10% increase. Um, but the reality is, 
regardless of how it happens, is that the private insurance industry has made up for shortfalls from government. That is just not going to be possible anymore for two big reasons. One, as I said, the demographics are such that the proportion of the population in the hospitals will increasingly be Medicare and Medicaid, and therefore the ability to go to that ATM machine, it just, you know, it would require premium increases that we've never seen before. And second, the market of the insurance industry is changing. And the ability of insurance companies to generate higher premiums from their source of money, the employers and private individuals, is really limited. So the bottom line of this discussion is that not only is government going to constrain its spending, but the ability of the private insurance market to make up the difference is, is limited as well. So the end product is that, is that we're going to see smaller growth rate in spending. I mean, look at what's gone on in the period from 2000, roughly, to 2013, 14. Health insurance premiums went up 182 percent. Workers' contribution have gone up almost 200 percent, while earnings have gone up 50 and inflation 40. I mean, the, this is one of the main reasons why we've had a stagnant um, a growth in real wages uh, in throughout the country. It's not that total compensation is not growing, but it's going increasingly to, to, to higher health care costs. So here's, the, here's what's going on, and here's the dilemma we face, and here's the dilemma you face in the health industry. There are two different approaches that the system could take to slow the growth in spending. For want of a better word, I'll use my economic jargon. It's a demand-side approach or a supply-side approach. The so-called demand-side approach is the following. Insurance companies are increasingly, and I'll show you in the next slide, are increasingly selling and employers are demanding that their employees take what we call high deductible or consumer-directed health plans. This is a complicated slide, but you'll see if, for those of you who can't read the numbers, if you go all the way up to the top, 1988, you see that big blue line. That's called traditional insurance, which is FIFA service. You go wherever you want. You pay the bill. That red line was what we call managed care or HMOs, and the yellow was PPO. When you go all the way down to the bottom, the blue line doesn't exist anymore. Traditional old line insurance is gone. The red line grew significantly into the middle to 1990s, reaching over 30 percent, and is now down to 15, 16 percent. But in its place, the major form of insurance in this country is that kind of yellowish, well, it's not yellow, it's, I don't even know what color you call it, but it's what we call PPOs, which is a combination of a little FIFA service and a little managed care. But on the far right, that light blue line, that's high deductible health plans, which are now 20% of the total market, which means increasingly your patients are coming in having to pay a portion of their costs. And, of course, either they can't pay it or they won't pay it or they will seek alternatives. And that is a big change in the insurance market. In addition, we are increasingly returning to networks of insurance, networks of providers. Let's go back to the 1990s. When we, in the 1990s, a two-second history, 
when the health care plan of President Clinton failed, the insurance market and employers increasingly did something that they had never done before. They forced millions of their insured into tightly managed plans, which we call managed care, which everyone said was the right thing to do until we did it. And this country hated it. And the pushback basically was on the form of the doctors and the health care and patients. The idea was, from the patient's point of view, anything that was saved, if there was anything, either went into the pockets of the employer or into the pockets of the insurance company, and neither the patients nor the health care industry saw any of the value. And so we essentially did away with managed care, and that's why that red line shrunk. Well, we're now recreating it in a different form. And there are, there are some big differences, particularly in what we called tiered networks, which basically says to an individual employee, you have a choice and you can decide. If you want to go into the standard insurance where the insurance will let you go wherever you want, you will have to pay a significantly higher premium, and you will pay it, not your employer. But if you choose a tiered or limited network or tiered network, then you can see the savings yourself. And since more and more of the premiums are now being paid by the employees, they're saying, okay, if I can get the benefits, then maybe it's not the end of the world. That it, we're unclear. We're going to have this fight again. I can predict it. We're already beginning to see it, where there's going to be pushback against these tiered networks. But I don't think it's going to be the same game as happened in the 90s. And the main reason is the difference in who pays the bill. In the 90s, it was the employer. Now it's the individual insured. So if we push back and do away with tiered networks, it's all of the extra money is going to flow back into higher premiums paid for by the individuals. So, you know, we'll have to see this play out. Increasingly, particularly in places like California, we're going to reference pricing, where insurance companies are basically saying, you know, I can get that um, hernia repair at the 50th percentile for X, if you, the hospital or healthcare system, charges 25% more to your, you, the individual patient, have to pay the difference. We're not paying for it. And again, there is movement in that area. There's going to be pushback, but there is going to do that. Now, in addition, we're seeing more and more uh, attempts to move to bundle or global payments. But I'll talk more about that in a minute because that's really the supply side. So the key to demand-side approach is to push consumers and payers to find lower-cost providers. And you and all the are taking a hard look and saying, you know, maybe if we can provide it for less, become more efficient, we can become a lower-cost provider without giving up on quality and access. That's the key. If you're perceived as a lower cost but poorer quality provider, then it's not so clear. But you are seeing examples around the country of places like Virginia Mason in, in California and some hospitals, which I'll talk about in a minute, in Massachusetts and maybe here, where you can say, look, we will be able to provide those services for less than the high cost spread. So this battle is just beginning. But I'm a two-handed economist. That's the demand side. The supply side approach basically is to give the suppliers, the hospitals, the doctors, the healthcare system, the financial tools and said, okay, we're going, we the payers are going to set up, and that's what the ACA did. We're gonna set up a payment system that says if you do save money, you can share in the savings. It's up to you. You can do business as usual, but if you're willing to go to bundled payments or to um, 
uh, forms of global payments, you can see the benefits in getting some of the savings. But here again, for the umpteenth time in my lifetime, is an attempt to reduce FIFA service. If there's any mechanism that has nine lives in American health care, it's FIFA. We were killing FIFA service in 1972. We were killing, and it was dead in 1982. It was dead, and, and they were saying prayers in 1992, and it is still alive. So are we, and you know, you talk to any analyst, they go, if we're going to have any possibility of attempting to control spending, you got to do away with fee-for-service medicine. It is, and I say the same thing. But having been there and watched it play out, this cat really does have nine lives. But if we don't do something about it, so here's the dilemma that you face as providers. If we don't do anything with FIFA service and you still have a payment system that is not going to grow, the only way that the payment system can deal with the continued FIFA service is just to pay less because they can't control volume. So the only way you say, okay, you know, you used to get $1,500 for that, we'll pay you $1,200, which is what happened a lot in the managed care world, and that's why we went from so-called managed care to managed costs. So in a way, it's even in the best interest of the provider community, the hospitals and the doctors, if to do away with fee-for-service, but go to a shared savings model, which allow you to benefit from the efficiencies. In other words, as opposed to the money only, so the key here is this money can go back to you. So suppose you save 10%. On the demand side, all that saving is gonna be generated back to lower premiums and back to the payers. In the supply side, much of that, half of it, three quarters of it can be pulled back onto your side of the equation. So from a provider point of view, you really do want the supply side to win because the demand side is a much tougher world. Um, but, um, and as I said, to make this work, you really do need to do away with FIFA service. And let me give you some real examples of that. Again, you have to decide. So I'm going to talk about my current life. In, uh, when I get to the state of Massachusetts. So I'm just going to, you all understand the issue about accountable care and bundle payments and how it works and reward you for becoming more. And I know that's what you're trying to do, Brian. You're trying to consolidate and find efficiencies within your system and bring together organizations that traditionally have been separate. And that's the right thing to do. And we know that moving away from fragmented and, and duplicates and wasteful services doesn't really help anybody. And again, it permits providers to pay for service. And here's the key issue. When I talked about rehospitalization, the best way of doing away with rehospitalization is to making sure that there's somebody out there in the community that's helping those patients deal with the fact that they're out of the hospital, but they're not, they're still sick, which means often paying for people who traditionally will not pay for under FIFA service system. But if you get to see the benefit of those efficiencies, then it pays for you. And we are seeing many examples around the country of where hospitals have hired uh, caseworkers um, uh, and uh, you know, care coordinators that call different things in different parts of the country. My friend, the governor of Oregon, has created a whole new Medicaid payment uh, delivery system. Not a payment system, a delivery system around these care coordinators in their Medicaid program. And he's gotten the support of the hospital industry to do it. But there are concerns about the supply side approach, and, and that is Right now, we do something we call shared savings, which is a, not the strongest technique 
as opposed to, say, risk, where the potential is actually for you as hospitals and doctors to actually share in a greater amount. But the idea is that if you don't, you also have the possibility of losing. In a shared savings model, it's only a one-sided game. If you don't get any savings, then you don't lose anything. It sounds good, but then in return, the government says, well, I'm not going to share too much of the savings. I'm going to take most of them for myself. But the really, but around the country, those institutions that feel they are in control, they said, we don't want a shared savings model. We want a risk model because we can make it work. But then we get most of the benefits. So rather than be 50-50, they get 75 or 80 percent of the things. So that's one thing. One of the really questionable aspects of the Affordable Care Act and the ACO system that's part of it is the ability of patients to opt out. Where did that come from? What I mean by that is that if you set up a mechanism to take care of your patients, and then you're going to be paid a capitated amount. We call it global payments. It's one thing, and you have this population, but that population halfway through a condition can say, well, I don't want to go to, you know, I mean, you know, my uncle's brother's son, the doctor, I want to go to him or her. And they're not part of your system. They can opt out. And you're still responsible. Where did that come from? Well, I'll tell you where it came from. Remember back in the 2000, in the 1990s, when millions of Americans were forced into managed care. They didn't ask to go into managed care. They had no choice. Their employer basically said, either you go into the managed care plan that I have contracted for, or you can't be insured in my plan. Which means it didn't take much for those patients to erupt and lead to the backlash. So when the people that designed the uh, Affordable Care Act and the ACO part of it, they said, we don't want to do that again. We're going to give patients the right to opt out. Well, that sounds wonderful. But if you're running a delivery system, it's not wonderful. I was on the board of the Tufts Medical Center in Boston. And we were running one of these things. And what we found is, you know, we, you know it's one thing when the patient's healthy. And then all of a sudden they get sick and they go, oh, but I want to go, you know, the, to the brand name because I have cancer or stuff like that. And we were stuck with the bill. They said, if you want us to manage these people, they have to stay with us. So this is going to be, this is a potential issue going down the line. And again, ACOs and bundled payments are voluntary. And we're finding a lot of plans are opting out because they don't want to go through the trouble of either investing the money or living with it. And we've not seen great success so far. But I want to talk about the bottom issue, which is a long, to make these systems work, you need to get bigger. You need to go essentially from the basic primary care, and now we're finding all the way through what we have traditionally called post-acute or long-term care. What we are finding, and I would suggest you take a look at a new Institute of Medicine study, the, some of the biggest increases in costs are not even for very complex uh, procedures like open heart surgery. The, often 50% of the costs to the payers, particularly Medicare, occur after the patient leaves the hospital. None of us, and I would raise my hand, and maybe some of your researchers, we didn't know this. People thought it's post-acute care, it's home health, it's a little bit of rehab. It ain't little. And not only that, one of the biggest reason why certain areas in this country spend a lot more money is on the post-acute side. So when we talk about a, a system, we need to think about a system that goes from basic primary care right through to post-acute or long-term care. That's a big job. Well, in what, when you put that together and you get bigger and bigger and bigger, one of the aspects that's occurred is that these systems then use their market clout to extract higher and higher rates 
from the insurance companies to try to get that part of the spigot to work. And that is causing trouble. So I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But right now, we are in a confused, you and we, the country, is in a confusing state. And that is, if you go down the ACO route and reorganize your system to count on global payments, and then it turns out they're not there, and you're still in a fee-for-service demand-side world, you're in the worst world you could be in. Now, I knew that in principle. So one of the jobs that I've taken on is that the governor of, for, and I'll talk, the state of Massachusetts in 2014 created a new cost containment system. And they put in, and I'll talk more about that in detail in a minute, but they put in place a new commission to oversee the system. And the governor asked me to chair it. And one aspect of this new system is that every November, October, we have a hearing for two days on what are the drivers and costs. And last November, October, in during that hearing, a physician who is in charge of a big network of physician groups around the state pleaded with us that you can't, you need to get this thing changed because they had created a whole network to, to do what I was talking about, to coordinate care through things and do that kind of stuff. But they needed essentially global payments or capitation to work. And then what they're finding is increasingly their patients are still in FIFA service and they're still PPO. They said, how we can't we can function. So if you're a hospital and your CFO is saying, we need to fill our beds. We need to get paid. That's the way we're getting paid. It's all well and good to talk about all this other stuff which we're not getting paid for, to keep people out of the hospital. We talk all the good game, keep them out of the hospital, keep them in lower cost, stuff like that. Well, that sounds great, and I'm all for it, but we don't, we don't get paid unless they come to the hospital. That's fee for service. So we're right in a very confused situation now. We, gotta, we as a country need to come up and decide which way we're going. We need to develop a common approach. And that brings me to the need to change the PPO model, which is that big line, which is where most private insurance is. And we need to get the PPO model to become more like what used to be called managed care, or at least have what we call a PPO attribution system, where you could create global payments, even though they're in a mixed set. It's not easy, but it is doable. So I just want to briefly talk about this issue in Massachusetts. Now, I should admit that I was a Fed. I mean, I spent my, I mean, I, was, I worked on the Bipartisan Commission of the Future of Medicare. Uh, I, I, I chaired the, the system that um, set rates for Medicare. I didn't even know we had states. I thought people that worked for states were like kids on training wheels, that they worked at a state, and once they took the training wheels off, they went to the go federal government, because that's where the action was. I'm here to tell you there really are states, and not only that, I am convinced, now maybe it's just where I sit now, but having still spending some time in Washington, I mean, we all know the truth that Washington is dysfunctional and not functioning. The action and the future of changing our delivery system is increasingly going to happen at states. And we see it playing out. Now, maybe Massachusetts, yes, it's an oddball state, but they've said the same thing about New Jersey. So uh, this is a bit of a plea for you to join us. So here's the issue. I mean, we were the first state to create universal health care. And in spite of what you read, read from a third world, third world uh, newspaper that comes out of New York that has walled in it, the state of Massachusetts is working. Our health reform has wor is working. And we made a bargain with our, with our citizens that said coverage first and then cost controlling costs. Just like 
the federal government made the, the, the bargain. And that is we created, whoops, did, did this thing totally die? I can tell the story without it, but I'm, unless I landed on it. Okay. So, as I said, in 2012, the, um, the legislature, after three other uh, pieces of legislation, we have a transparency law that requires every hospital and every insurance company to list exactly what everybody has to pay. And so now you can go online and see how much, if you want to have a hernia repaired or you want to have a, a, an MRI or whatever, you can see what the tr prices are in different places. Um, we have by far the best um, data system in the, in the country, if not the world. Uh, we have a new state uh, independent agency called the Center for Healthcare Information Analysis that m monitors and, and publishes uh, the prices uh, that different providers and insurance. And then in 2012, it created this, all these different pieces including changing the payment system, introducing new incentives for workforce, health planning, and in the middle, it created this new state agency, which is called the Health Policy Commission. And that's the commission that I chair. Now, it's a rather strange law in the following sense. The legislature and the governor moved right up to the precipice of, yes, regulating rates and saying that the state will henceforth regulate how much every group gets paid and stuff like that. And it stopped short of that. And it said to this commission, you have to make our system work better and we're gonna give you a lot of mechanisms for doing that and I'll explain them in a minute. But you cannot regulate and rates. You can help encourage community hospitals to become more efficient. You can check and make sure that the state lives within a budget. So as I said, help providers find ways of lowering costs. Help payers change the way they pay to promote value-based care. Help consumers and patients know what the needs, what, what their needs are and what insurance and care costs. And help the system restructure in a way that makes it work. The key to the, to our, to the legislation is to keep the growth in spending in our state, growth in spending inconsistent with the growth in the state's GDP. In other words, we're not talking about cutting. We're talking about having the growth. Now, we're talking about all spending, not just Medicaid. All spending, Medicare, Medicaid, private insurance, out-of-pocket payments, to grow by no more than the growth in the state's GDP, which we estimated about 3.6%. If we can do that, we can save a substantial amount of money over what could be the, 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 what was growing before. So, actually, for a while now, we have been on target. Yes, we are a very expensive state. In one measure, we are the most expensive state in the United States. We are spending on a dollar amount more on a per capita amount more than any other state. But we don't spend more as a percentage of our state income. I don't know, where's New Jersey? How are, do you know? You know what percentage of you? Yeah, so, so you're like us. So you're very expensive when, it, for those of you who haven't heard, Joel, you're very expensive when it comes to Medicare. I thought that was Louisiana. New Jersey? Lots of luck. Um, well, you, I, I'm sure you get good care for that, but I'm, sure. I'm here, so I'm going to be nice for a while. So, but the point here is that Massachusetts is very expensive, but we have we're a high income state. So, as a percentage of our state income, we're not the highest in the country. I can go up north to Maine or New Hampshire. Actually, they spend a higher percentage of their income on health care than we do, but we are expensive. 
we are two, two and a half percentage points higher than the national average. And when I was out in California, California actually uh, actually spends a smaller percentage than the national com uh, rate. But and so it's been flat roughly to 2012. Now that we're going to get the latest numbers in 2013 and 14, we'll see. I think we're going to stay flat for at least two through 2013. What happens in 2014 now is up to us. So we're not a regulatory body, but we're close. So now I don't know how much time I have. Do I? Where am I on time? I, I don't. What time am I supposed to end? We started late. Is it? People don't mind going to if you're all right, because I, I, I want to give you the what happened this week. And this is a long story, which I will really condense. One of the aspects of this commission and the law is that any consolidation, merger, any form of integration within the health system must be reviewed by this commission to determine what impact it has on quality, cost, and access in the state. Now, many of them, so uh, 10 physicians merging with another 10, we just let go by. It's two small hospitals combining, we, we just don't look at it. But soon after we were formed, our biggest delivery system called Partners Healthcare. Now, for those of you, anybody from Massachusetts? Anybody know Massachusetts? There, you all know Partners. It is the Mass it started at the Massachusetts General and the Brigham. Uh, and if you ask them, they will tell you the two best hospitals in the world. And I, I won't question them since I got my health care there. Um, merged and to form partners. So that was one thing. But then they took on and they bought a hospital up north, North Shore. And then they went west and they bought Newton Wellesley. And they are basically 13 hospitals, 6,000 uh, odd physicians, and I don't even, you know, I, the, the billions of dollars of their budget. And they decided since they, they already controlled the North and almost controlled the West, they were going to merge with the largest community hospital in the South called South Shore. And we had been on the job about a month. And little, you know, all of a sudden it hit us. Now, our job was to review this. But the law does not let us stop it. All we can do is turn our results over to the Attorney General and to the Justice Department. So we reviewed it and we found based, and I should point out that Partners, because of its power, has been able to generate anywhere from 30 to 50 percent more to be paid for the same services that are provided to other hospitals in the area and that their doctors make 20 to 30% more simply by being part of the partner system. And that's been documented over and over again. Um, and I'm talking about even getting more than their sister institutions that are other Harvard big teaching hospitals like the Beth Israel or the or Deaconess now and, um, or the Tufts Medical Center. So it's not only academic medicine versus the community hospital. So we did our report, and we found that it would significantly increase prices and costs. Of course, they reacted quite negatively to our report and wrote back a, an attack on us. And then we wrote back a very balanced and logical and high-quality <laughs> retort to them. Fact-based, as I say, as opposed to emotionally based. And we said, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, you're going to do something. They said, we're going to do all these good things. We're into high-cost case management, and this is a new world. And we said, yeah. But you're also going to generate a 30% increase in prices. And So we did what we were supposed to do. We turned it over to the attorney general, and we said, OK, here it is. And that was back in uh, January, December. And on Monday of this year, week, the Attorney General announced what happened. And I think it's going to have very interesting ramifications all over. I should point out, among us, that it wasn't only the Attorney General, but it was also the Justice Department in Washington 
that had been looking at partners for a long time. And it's not a big secret to say that within the Massachusetts system, the other providers and, of course, the insurers were behind the scenes rooting us on and rooting on. And, and many of them wanted to break partners up and do all this, you know, take Humpty Dumpty and, you know, break them up. So what happened was, no, they didn't break them up. But they said to partners, based on our report, not only are we concerned about what you're going to do to South Shore, but we're concerned about what you've done on the North and what you've done on the West. And I won't go into all the details, but they said to them, if you want to merge with the South, you have to go to a whole set of changes. For example, if you bring the South Shore doctors under your wing, you can't immediately raise their rates to what you're being paid in other parts. You can't raise the hospital rates. You have to keep them separate for anywhere from five to seven years. You have to bar, you can't bargain as one unit, which is what they were doing. So they said basically to an insurance company, turns out the relative power was so strong. They would go to an insurance company and they would say, if you want to send your patients down to the Mass General, you have to pay those, the rates that we want you to pay to community hospitals that are 20, 30 miles away. And the insurance companies had no power to change that. So anyway, I won't go in. I more than suggest you can look on the website. And it, 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 it more than slapped their hands. But what it did, it said, okay, partners, you say you can change the delivery system. So we're not going to deny you at the end for some degree of consolidation. And besides, you're a very big and good system, and you're there. And and I was all supporting this. We are we were not there to destroy a very good healthcare system. What we were there to say is, you no longer can make these calls independent of the potential impact on the community. And you know, so some people, so this thing came out, and some people are screaming. They want the partners totally broken up. Uh, uh, and I said, hey, this is not possible. First of all, I don't, we didn't have the legal authority to do that. It would have been court actions for years to come. So I had nothing to do with the final decision made by the Attorney General and the Justice Department, but it is going to have ramifications all over the country. We're already seeing it. A, a judge in Idaho struck down a, a big merger of two, a big system out there saying, yeah, there are some savings, but there are cost increases. So. Here's the end of the story. States, we already have the state of Maryland is going to uh, a more expanded all-payer system. The state of Vermont is going to an all pay, is in an all-payer system um, uh, and is moving towards some form of modified single-payer. The state of Oregon has changed, as I said, not only has it changed its Medicaid program, but it's now bringing all its state employees under this, and it wants to eventually pull in the private sector as well. You have other states that are looking into this. So the question is, as I said in the beginning, the possibility of states like New Jersey, uh, New York is looking into different aspects of it. As I said, the federal government is, is, <laughs> is, is what we all know it is, which is sort of not functioning very well. And so if we're going to make some attempts at slowing, and again, slowing the growth so that we can maintain a high quality system and afford it. I think the roles are increasingly gonna be at the state body. And as I say to people, my job is ultimately to be the health system's mother. 